Hello, everyone. We're here to talk about 13 terrifying tips for crafting killer messaging. This works for your equity crowdfunding campaign, works for any investor marketing initiative at that, and really is applicable best practices towards your user acquisition, including customers, SaaS users, mobile installs. We're getting ready for Halloween over here. You may have seen the creative. This is our October webinar and have a star-studded cast from our team here at DNA. Abby, do you want to kick off the backgrounds, tell them who you are, why you're on the webinar, why all of this matters coming from us today, and hand it off to Emily and Mark? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. I'm Abby. I'm the account director here. And I actually have fun with every single campaign that comes to us because I delight in the discovery process. And it's really best when we do get the chance to start with a strategy, and we'll get into all the details, but it really gives us a, the right start to craft the right messaging. And, oh, I could tell you some spooky tales about the times when we haven't started with a, a good plan, right? Sometimes you get thrown into it trying to recover. Anyway, we have tons of experience. I want to introduce the rest of our team here. We've got Mark Lofgraben, our editor, and Emily Werner, our account manager. Emily, you're up next. Tell us a little bit about your perspective on hmm, something spooky this season for equity crowdfunding. Well, I, I, I think we may have actually just very briefly lost her. Um, oh, OK. Well, then it's Mark. <laughs> That leaves me. Hi, I'm uh, I'm Mark Laufgraben. I'm the content editor here at DNA. Um, uh, you know, Abby spoke a little bit about what she loves about uh, our process. For me, you know, I've I'm always uh, I've always been in love with words, and I love making them work for our clients. You know, we we have this vast array of different dreams that we work with every single day, and it's up to us to find the words and the imagery to bring those dreams to life. And uh, that's what uh, keeps me going. Uh. Exactly. And Abby, Mark, Emily work on a high volume of these campaigns. Some of the top campaigns in the industry. We just wrapped Avidane Graphene at 4.5 million. They sold out their shares last Thursday. We're in October here. You could take a look at that campaign on Net Capital. Every month we have one of the top raises in the space. We work with funds, real estate, all different types of initiatives where we're able to target investors and take them down marketing funnels for your non-capital raise audiences, target premium audiences and take them down funnels that end in conversion. We've worked on over 400 of these investor marketing campaigns that have collectively produced nine figures of capital and uh, as I mentioned, that, that that's where the findings come from. So if you're not familiar with our webinars, if you're not familiar with our uh, podcast, Test Optimize Scale, definitely want to take a look at those afterwards. We prepare a new presentation every month uh, on a different topic. It's always a, a new deck here. It's the first time, believe it or not, we've used this imagery and uh, we do it as thought leadership. We want to see a higher success rate industry-wide. Uh, on these campaigns, when you look at how many are, are funded at the VC level, under 5%, how many are funded at equity in equity crowdfunding, top 10% are moving, bottom 50% are pretty stagnant. So we want to uh, be an open book and share insights in terms of what we see working. Abby, strategist, enth strategy enthusiast, what, what, would you say about a solid foundation and where messaging really needs to begin? Not just throwing a one-liner into an open field and Facebook ad manager, but really mapping out the full plan. Yeah. Hmm, where to start? There's so much value that we get out of doing a strategy with each of our clients. And I like to think of marketing as sort of, we have the foundation. We, we know that there are certain key elements that work when it comes to getting the message out. We have a plan for the kinds of key themes that we want to touch on because we see it working over and over again. But uh, because we work with such a variety of different kinds of clients and because there are so many different kinds of things out there, I mean, think it could be from manufacturing to alcohol from cookies, like actual physical edible things to, um, 
I don't know, a licensing technology company or a software, so a surface or fintech. It could be any kind of thing, right? So when we get started, we want to see what's working out there in your industry. We want to get examples for how your competitors are doing it and then layer into, into that what your key strengths are as a company, right? And so being able to do a strategy then gives us that time to think about, okay, here's where we are with your messaging as it stands. Let's practice it a few times, practice your pitch, hear what comes out in terms of what are the key messages that are going to resonate with your investor audience or whatever your key goals are. Um, so that's really where we like to start and the strategy. And then that we take our time. I think it's always worth the time to spend some thought getting it right at the very start. Yes. And that is, so we got, I talked a little bit about our first couple points there. I saw you sharing the slide, Jason. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So wrapping up this, you know, mm -hmm. meme page, you wouldn't drive cross country without a map. Maybe you need to change things along the way, but this should really be an algorithmic roadmap of how you're going to get to your goals, not just putting it out there and hoping that your your whole goal is hit. And in a short period of time, here's the model we've built, the eight point plan. We've written about this in Forbes. We had workshops in person, digitally on just this. Emily, in your experience, what's the importance of a solid foundation via strategy? And, and how does that evolve into good, effective messaging? Oh, I think you're on mute. Still on mute. One more time. Part of the technical difficulties of Zoom here. Um, Mark, maybe you want to hop on and talk about this a bit. Sure. Um, so we're talking about the foundation of strategy yes. here. Um, so, you know, th there, there's really a lot that goes into it. Um, you know, we have to talk about all the disparate aspects of your business. And, you know, when they're when you don't have them yet, when it's a prospective you know, business, you have to sort of fill it in in your head and talk about your plans. So, you know, we have things talked about here, like the industry analysis. You know, what what is the industry that you're going to be going into? What does the market look like? You know, what, what kind of situation does it appear to be on the ground? And how are you going to disrupt that market? How are you going to seize a piece of it? Uh, we talk about, you know, competitor audits. I mean, that really just flows from that. I mean, you need to look at who your, who your competitors are and what they're choosing to do. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you've got to look at the strategies that they've undertaken and see how that you can best apply them to your business. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it, it's really, there's really, each one of these aspects needs to be touched upon. You know, when we talk about, we're going to get into social proof later, um, you know, strategic partnerships can heavily bear on that. You know, who are you allied with? Who are you working with? Especially if they're names that investors might be familiar with. Um, the bigger, the better, right? You know, if you are partnered with like NVIDIA, you know, your chip maker, then you want the world to know that because that's sending an incredibly important signal to the market, which is that these major players think that you're worth partnering with. Um, so, you know, channel strategy. You know, that, that's sort of where the rubber hits the road, right? I mean, you need to plan out exactly how you're going to, you know, make best use of various, you know, social media channels. So, you know, th those can take different forms depending on what kind of business you are. Like some, some products or businesses might do better working with Instagram, you know, some with a younger prospective audience might look good on TikTok. You know, others might go uh, look great on X. And we certainly recommend Facebook as a major channel, you know, to reach it has worldwide reach um, and still, you know, source of a great source of potential investors. So, you know, what you're going to do with every potential channel, including and especially email, is going to make a big impact when you're designing your strategy for your race. 
And I think people get let down when I meet with them in person and they ask me for the best messaging for their business. And I point them back to the strategy to you know really come to the table with the right set of variants. Because that's what we're ultimately going to be talking about here, right? Uh, A-B tests uh, of audience, creative, and funnels, and the messaging that goes into the creatives, the messaging that goes into each funnel. If you don't know what's happening in your industry, if you couldn't tell me exactly what your competitors are running, you're really not equipped to write creative for your brand. Uh, Doesn't take long. Go into Ad Library on Facebook. Go into you know, SpyFu, SEMrush, any search platform that'll show you the search ads that are running. Do, do your own searches. See what comes up in terms of the keywords. You want to understand what your competitors are sending out in their email newsletters. There's email platforms to do so, such as Mild, or you, know, you should really be subscribed to all of them. Search Google News. Uh, look at who's talking about them on social. Look at who's linking back to them as a whole across these platforms. If they're live uh, on an equity crowdfunding platform, look at their offering page, their video, their weekly updates, all the questions that they're answering. I want to know which influencers are talking about them. I want to know what conferences they're going to, which podcasts they've been on recently. I need to understand everything that they're doing to obtain market share so that your creative surpasses theirs. Your creative adds to the conversation, not just, you know, goes completely off track. Maybe that is the out of the box, but you still want to know what the box is. And that, that's really the basis for what you're going to build because you're then going to look at which audiences are moving the most, which channels, the touch points, as Mark said, you're going to reach those audiences, the creative initial ads, content calendar, what's going to be posted when and where and in each touch point of the funnel. Cause it's usually not the first touch point that they convert, especially not on investment. Seventh touch point is optimistic. Probably going to be later than that, especially if you're talking Reg D, a credit investor raise, it's going to be much later than that. So you want to be intentional about what these audiences see when they're searching around, doing their due diligence and, and what they're going to experience all the way through. You better be showcasing momentum. You better be showcasing traction. You, you build all this in the creative. You look for strategic partners to accelerate it. You put down, to project, put down projections, never run creative without having an idea of what you're going to measure. The only way to measure is with numbers, have your KPI set up, and then summarize all this in an activation list, uh, an executive summary, two-page version of this. And, and to take it back to the competitor audit point, I could already hear people saying in the back of my head, we don't have any competitors. We're the only people who do what we do. We're special. We're unique. I'm not talking about the product. I'm talking about marketing. You're competing against other brands for that mind share. Your ads are going to show up against other brands, whether they have the same product as yours or, or, or not. Uh, if you're running a Reg CF campaign, regulation crowdfunding, it's probably going to be other Reg CF campaigns there. If you're on Start Engine or WeFunder, it's probably going to be other campaigns from there. Meta is very good at determining what audiences want to see. If they click on your ad, guess what? They're going to see a similar ad afterwards because of the AI behind it. So don't get caught up into why your product's better. Marketing all a matter of what you're doing to, to take investors, take premium audiences into your marketing funnel and convert them and your messaging better sell. Less is more. If you could, you know, say something in three words in your ad copy, do that. You know, there's exercises like Ryan Follin's 313 method where you break what you do down into three sentences, then one sentence, then three words. That's powerful in ad messaging. That That's powerful in creative. And really, you're making an uneducated decision if you're trying to determine uh, what you want to run in terms of your creative without actually deep diving and seeing what's what's at play there. This usually takes us a month to create. Uh, other groups, you know, could be less, could be more. I've seen agencies take six months to work on just this part and hire an agency just for strategy. I've done it in a few hours during workshops. You could streamline and do four sections a week and do it in two weeks. But do not skip this step. You're really planning to fail if you do. Failing the plan is planning to fail. It's telling yourself, it's probably not going to work. Let me just throw some, you know, spaghetti at the wall. We'll see what sticks, you know? This has got to be that roadmap to how you're going to hit your goals. Abby, how do we get a fresh perspective? How can founders, how can issuers get a fresh perspective when putting their own creative together? 
Oh, competitor marketing audit helps. <laughs> I, think we've, um, I think, you know, just hiring an outside eye, like a, a marketing agency like we are, um, bouncing it off someone else. I, you know, the most successful founders are the founders that really put themselves out there. They're the ones who are meeting with potential investors and giving them their pitch. And you know what? Every time you do that, you get questions back and you can learn from each of those questions, right? Everyone who you encounter and you tell your story to is a new set of unbiased eyes. So what you really want to be doing is taking in that message. How are our people reacting to your message and how can we refine it to make it even more compelling or to help even answer the question before it comes up, right? Like how every, you should imagine that every time you do a pitch or try to make a sale, you, you have a chance to get fresh feedback from, from anyone. Anyway, I love to play that role. Um, it's fun for us as a team. We often during our department huddles are going through different investment offerings, talking about, okay, well, where could this be strengthened? What are the like small minor changes that we could use, uh, employ to like hit the high notes on headlines? We've got to remember people have very limited time. Well, we, uh, attention spans are shrinking and you have to capture their attention and make them want to learn more. But Jason's always saying this, we, we're trying to make irresistibly clickable content and ads. So I don't know if I've anyway. said it exactly in those words, but I love it. Irresistibly <laughs> clickable. Mark, do you want to add to that? Sure. Um, so, you know, from my perspective, one thing that I see a lot, and I think that this is a very helpful thing for uh, someone running C's campaigns to learn, um, is that you get so into the weeds in your business that you sort of assume that the world knows it as well as you do. Um, but they absolutely don't, you know? You know, the people you're dealing with are, are frequently, you know, they're smart people, you know, very savvy, but they might not know all the details of the industry that you're in. And that's why it's so important when you're creating copy for these opportunities that you look at them with a pair of fresh eyes. You, you, you ask yourself, okay, if I didn't work in this industry at all, would I understand what I'm saying here? And would I understand, even if they do understand what you're saying, would I understand why it's important? So those are two separate things, right? Mm -hmm. they, they might, you know, get the gist, but they might not appreciate why it's so valuable. Like, you know, let's say, you know, you come up with, I don't know, you know, your, your chemical, you know, is going to recycle like aluminum hydrate, you know, and to you, like it works in the industry, you realize, oh, that's like, you know, incredibly useful, incredibly valuable. There's so much money in that. But, you know, a lot of readers, you know, they don't know what, what you're talking about. So you need to bring it into terms that everybody can understand, you know, give concrete examples that bring your race to life. And so the, the, suddenly they're on board. And not only are they, they've learned something that they know that most people don't know. And that creates a connection between me and you, you know, that makes them feel like they've attached themselves to something special as the first step to really getting them interested in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I like removing the curtains, taking down the walls, ask your actual end audience. So fresh perspective, as you're putting together creative, we're about to go in some tactics uh, on how on these next slides, uh, you're writing them for your end audience. You should present them to your end audience, IRL in real life, as the kids say, 10 people is such a light focus group and it's not hard to do and you'll get some findings. And as Mark said, get out of your head. I mean, that's why the biggest brands in the world work with agencies. They could hire anyone they want, but they want to bring in these external groups that are working on a high volume of campaigns. They're testing things in the market. They're seeing what's working. They're incorporating it into the marketing department, which is otherwise an echo chamber. We do this because we like this and here's our mission. And that's great, but you need to get the actual data. You need to get the actual responses to show what's working. As Abby said, if you bring on agencies, consultants, any type of industry professionals, this is not a promotion for us, but to get outside of your 
own way, your own thinking, to have variants, to have tests, to be able to show what's working because of the performance metrics is stronger. So examine your materials and unbiased eye, start bringing others into that set. And then now you can start playing with what those A-B tests, those variants are going to be. Again, we need the data to show us what's working. Abby, how do we expertly present our opportunity as marketers, as, as advertisers, as the brand? Well, uh, it starts with, we work with whatever brand assets each company has, right? So we have to work with how the, where the company is coming from. Um, and then we, we help often reframe it a little bit. I can see here, we've got a, one, of my, one of our favorite examples, right? Uh, this is Avidane. They did have just a huge success. And what I'd really love to see, their founder really uh, worked hard to achieve this level of success. And I want to just emphasize in terms of messaging of what we're looking at right here, they have featured, they've set goals and they've achieved them, right? They talk about that. Um, and we're always looking at new company traction, right? So they've got uh, strategic partnerships. They have other founders that they're referencing. They had a federal grant. They have multiple patents. They're looking at a huge market opportunity and giving you a statistic about the size of it. Uh, they have uh, just this huge variety of social proof and company traction that makes it interesting. Um, something that really stood out in terms of their success, he, he really, they were able to leverage buy recommendations from different groups in a really effective way. Um, um, what else? In terms of how we, we were able, able to work with them, I think something across their campaign, right, because we were helping with ads and content marketing and sometimes strategic outreach at moments. Um, the, the webinars over time were really good, right? So in terms of getting the message out there, early stage investors are often looking at the team, the founders. We hear this again and again. People invest in people. And so one way to get out there digitally is by hosting online events like webinars. And so if you have an investment opportunity out there, you should probably and definitely at least at a minimum be doing a recorded pitch deck presentation followed by an FAQ, uh, hopefully with an investor audience. Um, this campaign, had webinars every single month about different pieces of company traction, different new partnerships, um, exciting things along the way. And I, I strongly believe that this was a key driver for their overall success, because then it was something that we could point back at. We could you know, point people back to, oh, well, take a look at the founder answering that question. Um, but okay, to conclude, it is a multi-layer approach, right? It's not just one thing that gets your opportunity out there. Like Jason's saying, people need to encounter your brand multiple times and it shouldn't feel repetitive. These are sophisticated people um, who are considering an investment in your company, right? And you really wanna approach them in a clear and direct way with interesting new things all the time um, and keep reminding them why. Um, sure. so those are some of the things, Jason, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah. And look at the lure of your investment on the offering page, top reasons to invest, talk about the growth, what sets you apart from key competitors. I like to look for the moments that investors eyes light up in a physical investor pitch. And, uh, I got to see one last night for a uh, you know, group that was doing their demo in person here in LA. And it, it's often not the moments the founder gets most excited about, but you could see the audience respond the most to. So they're trying to figure out why to invest. You're giving them the top reasons, You're making it easy on them. Uh, talk about the growth. Hey, hey, that's how their investment's gonna become more valuable. Looking at the valuation today, how are you getting to the next valuations is what they need to understand. Uh, you know, liquidity events, exit, stra exit strategy, talked about in ads at times on offering pages, uh, you know, at other periods, you know, as a general rule of thumb, it's typically there. 
Uh, what sets you apart from the competitors? Huge market opportunity, pent up demand, no known competitors. You, you want to be able to talk about why they should care and you get to structure their narrative. You get to tell them how they're going to think. They're actually going to use the same words that you put into the messaging when they talk about this to their friends, family, or cycle in their head, asking themselves, should I actually give money to these guys? Should I put, you know, this in? Do I want to put my personal information out there? My, my you know, billing information? Internet's littered with scams. Do I want to do this? Uh, <laughs> am I going to see money back? Uh, you, you want to be able to determine how they're going to look at this, and you get to do so. Uh, IP global protected and green technology, breakthrough on commercial scaling, licensing, licensing business model, capitalite recurring revenue. All of these are encapsulating rants that we've heard fr from founders and have used similar types of messaging on various campaigns, but we're breaking it down into a few words. Breakthrough on commercial scaling. I speak about that for an hour for most of our clients and for brands that we've seen work in the B2B space. Uh, licensing business model, capital light, recurring revenue. Hey, we just compound sentence three long ideas in there. High qualified experience leadership team. Realize I didn't put multiple paragraphs in there. I I, I put you know five words and Amber Sample is, is that the, the and that's the name of it, right? Strong partners, being able to point at third party validation. Uh, it's my favorite type of creative. Don't believe what we're saying. Believe what Panasonic said. Don't, don't just listen to us. Look who recently talked about us in the news. Check out this podcast that featured us. We just moderated this panel. We just spoke on this panel. Look at what our lead investor is saying. We're doing a webinar with our lead investor. Here's the messaging to talk about what's going to happen on that webinar and in that long form content. You want to have that line around the block. We're going to talk more in here about numbers. Being able to speak about the crowd takes away any misconceptions around an empty restaurant uh, of a company or an investor base that that you may have. Uh, I heard Jason Frischman, who has a name just like mine, uh, at Net Capital say on a panel, uh, we were on a panel for the Future of Equity Crowdfunding and Investment Week last Friday, everyone wants to be first to be second. <clears throat> this is true in the VC community. A big fund, a big investor participates. The next day, there's a list of other investors. The deal is signed off on. It's, it's approved. Everyone wants to get in now. So you get to lure others over by talking about those strong partnerships, by, by talking about the social proof, by making people excited about all the others that are, are speaking about you. Mark, you are a linguistic expert. You perform the editing across all of our advertising and content marketing campaigns for each account manager, each writer, each designer. I could think of no one better to speak about the art of narrative but you. You want to hop onto this next page for us? Sure. You know, I mean, narrative, when people hear that word, they think of storytelling. And of course, storytelling is an important part of what we do but what story are we telling and to who and for why um we have to consider who the audience is you know who who are we speaking to in in our case it's very frequently investors so the stories we create are with them in mind you know we're we're trying to ask the questions investors are asking as they're reading through these raises, you know, the one, the very ones that would emerge in their minds. And then we answer them in a way that most engages them, All right? So, you know, we talk about highlighting the problem and solution and really hit home what drives your prospective users and investors. So it's like, you gotta start somewhere, right? And the place you start with is, look, something in the world ain't right. There is a problem out there. And you explain what the problem is and why the reader should care about, it, which is usually money, right? I mean, the idea is it's a major problem with a big market that are aching for a solution. Um, so the idea is you've identified this major issue and 
here comes your business, your business as a solution to this problem. You know, one thing we mentioned before, we talked a little bit about like IP. You know, a nice thing about IP is if you've got it, you know, that means that your solution is locked down. It's your solution. No one else is going to be able to use it unless you license it. The point is that by talking about what's special about your solution, having laid the groundwork by talking about the problem, you're getting people's attention. There's this hole in the world, you're going to fill it, and here's how. And oh, by the way, there's a lot of money in it. So that's the kind of you know narrative that you're looking to craft. Then once you've set that stage, you have to make them believe in you. Because, okay, yes, you've identified a problem. They get that. And yes, okay, here's at least a prospective solution, a possibility. But why you? Why are you the one to fix that problem? And you make them believe. And there's a million different things that you can do to make them believe. You know, we talked about social proof before. You know, all the different people who believe in you, either financially, you know, through investment, or through a business partnership, you know, or just like, you know, in the case of users who believe in your product, you know, you can talk about people who've had wonderful experiences with you. Or, you know, you can talk in a more abstract way why you are the kind of person people should believe in, you know, why you like have this long and glorious history in this industry. You know, you know what you're doing. You've worked for these, you know, huge Fortune 500 players. And it's like, why did you leave? Because you saw this incredible gem of an opportunity. An opportunity that you, the reader, are seeing now too. And no one else has seen yet. That makes both of us pretty special. And, you know, there's so many things that create action, right? Uh, if we look at psychology, you know, immediacy, we see the best performance during the closing of a campaign. Uh, we've had campaigns do, you know, over 30% of their raise, uh, up, upwards of 50% on some initiatives in their final month, their final couple weeks. Uh, that 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 sense of time is running out space is limited only so many shares left now's the time to get in at this valuation can create action it also touches on fear and you know mark talked about the money aspect uh but you know in our surveys it goes beyond that seeing a, a reg cf issuer uh put in you know five hundred dollars a thousand dollars towards an investment sure they, they could see that multiple uh, you know, return five to 10 years in. Absolutely. Maybe they get two grand, 10 grand back. Greater percentage chance, uh, greater percentage chance that they'll get nothing back. If you look at private equity, uh, you know, just heard on stage the other day of if, if eight out of 10 of your investments fail, but those two really hit, it makes the whole exercise worthwhile. So why are retail investors participating early stage? Is, is it for that high risk, high return type of activity? Yes. Uh, but it's also for the experience we found, meaning they want to be part uh, of a company around data protection. They want to be part of impact investments. They want to be part of investments that uh, you know, could play a role in uh, global peace. They could play a role towards uh, better uh, infrastructure for cities. Uh, we've worked with tunnel boring companies. Worked with, you know, Abby was mentioning graphene company that's you know, likely going to replace a lot of the, the steel. You know, a lot of different materials as a whole in products that we use every day. Uh, we've worked with all different types of organizations that are cutting edge, uh, next level type products, and they'll talk about fear. They'll talk about. Uh, what it means for this company not to excel. And as Mark was speaking, really addressing the problem in a way that inspires activity. 
Uh, humans are more likely to act out of fear than for their own self-growth. So you want to play around with that when it turns to messaging. And as I mentioned before, you do not want to work off assumptions as much as data. We need the actual numbers to show us what's working. So you want to harness the power of analytics. Uh, you want to have variance in terms of your audience, your messaging, and your funnels and let the click-through rates, let the conversion rates, let those irresistible click-through rates, as Abby likes to say, uh, guide where you're going. Um, otherwise, you're shooting in the dark. You could shut off a whole channel. You could tell yourself marketing doesn't work. Equity crowdfunding doesn't work. Your business doesn't work. The world doesn't work. The industry doesn't work. There's so many things to point at at any given time. If you look at the success rates of startups, or as I mentioned, of capital raising at any in any re arena, uh, success rates are not great. You need to act outside of that. So by putting together the right uh, sequence uh, of messages with variants for each, you're going to be able to look at where traffic's falling off. Uh, you know, we're looking at a breakdown here with page view, add to cart, purchase of investments. Uh, this is in a uh, period of about three weeks, September 26th to October 19th for a campaign. And it's showing the, the volume of investments. Uh, it's showing the conversion rates all the way through. But as you can see, uh, it takes a it takes a lot. Uh, Fifty seven thousand visitors to produce eight hundred eighty six investors. Uh, it, it it can be a lot lower than that. It could be around there that two percentage uh, type of rate. Uh, but this, these are the sheer numbers. Of, that's how we get there is by looking at those variant tests and being able to see where traffic's falling off. What type of messaging do we want to run for the at the at the cart stage? What type of messaging do we want to run to the purchase stage? I mean, hey, we'll see 10 to 30% of investors participate multiple times on these rounds. I want it to be 30%. I don't want to be 10. That that's capital that's just sitting there that we can access if we have the right messaging to get those audiences back to be able to tell them that their position is great. But there's so much more. Look at all the new momentum just since they participated. We want to stimulate social sharing, peer-to-peer -peer marketing. Uh, if, if you know, loved ones, coworkers, friends, family, whoever it may be is telling them to invest, uh, telling new audiences to invest, that, that grassroots social sharing, peer-to-peer -peer marketing can actually take place. And, and that's where, you know, you may get half of your investments from advertising. You may get 20% of your investments from advertising and you're paying for that traffic, but it's then multiplying and bringing in, you know, far more, you know, two to five times the amount of conversions on top of that. I'd be anything to add to the numbers and, and what those conversations look like with clients. Absolutely. I love that part. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the data is fun for me. I have a science background. I was like, for example, as a teaching assistant, as a uh, quantitative analysis in graduate school. So I get into the data and it really tells a story. So when, during my client calls, I'm always trying to, you know, help uh, interpret what the numbers are telling us in terms of how we might change and like Jason was saying, we have a couple of levers to play with. It's really either the messaging that we're telling or the audience that we're telling it to. And we can look and see. And it's really, it's really great. I, I enjoy this very much. We have a couple of different ways to look at the analytics. Um, it's quite detailed. And the pixel is actually giving us more data than ever because it used to just track, did someone make an investment or not? And on a lot of cases, depends on the back end, but we can also see ads to cart, you know, uh, other conversion steps along the way. So you can really see then that we're playing for the end game when, as Jason's saying, you know, we see a higher conversion rate at the end with people reacting to immediacy or fear of missing out. It's just this natural human psychology around acting around urgency or kind of putting things off until it's almost too late. Um, Anyway, so there's just so much data, you know, not, ads aren't the only place where we see the data. I also really find LinkedIn to be an extremely powerful tool for, especially for uh, B2B or investor acquisition campaigns. Um, and there's a lot of data that we draw out of that too. We're testing different messages, seeing how people are reacting, adjusting the messages, adjusting the, the uh, audiences, depending on reactions. Um, I love that part of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and 
Executing a strategic approach, concise and direct messaging on LinkedIn works well. Be engaging and informative. Don't blend in to all the other spam that's on LinkedIn or email. Uh, you do have to test multiple audiences, but quick to the point. One sentence. Each sentence seems to matter. Each sentence could be its own paragraph, if you will. So it's visually easy to consume. And speaking with numbers, speaking with numbers, speaking with numbers. Uh, if I tell you a company's big, they're doing great things, it doesn't mean anything compared to, hey, they have 10% market share, $100 million valuation, you know, $2 million a month in sales, $10 million a month in sales. You want to be able to show magnitude uh, with that that first message. Otherwise, you will get lost. Uh, we've seen uh, you know, $500,000 investment conversations happening this month from LinkedIn outreach. We've seen other six-figure you know, 50K type investments come out of the outreach from LinkedIn. I believe it's underrated in terms of outreach. Ads, we generally see higher click-through rates, better traffic performance from elsewhere. You can reach the same audiences and the same data targeting uh, that you can with outreach. And you know every profile can send 25 plus messages per day looking for a 20% or higher acceptance rate, 20% or higher response rate. Every CEO should be using it daily. Um, if we're looking more towards the evolution of this uh, meme with Ice Cube, people after seeing the same ad 10 times, uh, by Felicia. All ads have a limited lifespan. Don't forget to refresh creatives. I like to think of the ad development that we do uh, almost like a, a content marketing calendar with, you know, social, maybe it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, excuse me, X, LinkedIn, determining what posts are going where. Let's also figure out what ads are going where. Maybe it's the posts that are going to most engagement and you're putting traffic around it. But this is a major undertaking for copywriters to have new mes messaging to show all of the traction that business is getting. We've already talked about a few different types, uh, but continue AB testing that every week. Check out the new partnerships, check out the new deals, check out these new investors that have been added. Here's the new investor testimonials. Uh, here's a press release we put out. It was covered by Yahoo Finance and Business Insider and the Wall Street Journal. There's plenty of tech press releases that will get you there. Uh, you want to be able to uh, continuously test new creatives on top of your evergreen, the ones that run and are performing and continuing to drive. You want to optimize towards the style of the messaging that's resonating with your audience. Some people think it's only video. Nope. I was just on a podcast with one of the top uh, media buyers in the world, and they say, hey, static drives performance. Uh, maybe it's a blend of video and static. Some of our best ads have been video, but we need the data to show us the selfie videos with clients walking around town, walking around their warehouse, walking in front of their developers, taking the key words that come out of there and using that as the text above the image, the headline below the image, which would be slightly larger and bolder, and the newsfeed link description to give more underneath it. Uh, but, but literally, if someone keeps seeing the exact same ad, they're going to tune you out. It may even affect your ad quality score. Uh, if you are, um, if they're removing you because they keep seeing that ad over and over again, Mark, what are some of the struggles with creative evolution? What have you seen to be the most beneficial for our development team and the founders that we work with, uh, in making sure everything is grabbing? Sure. I mean, well, you know, I've definitely have plenty to say, uh, on this topic. Um, but, uh, yeah, so basically you know, Abby talks a little bit about quantitative research. And so when you're talking about crafting marketing com content, you know, the content itself, the copy that you're writing or the graphics you're creating, I mean, that's an art, right? But understanding what works is a science. You can't just go based on vibes. You know, your business is too important for that. You need to understand what works and what doesn't but especially what does, because the lessons you learn from what does is what's going to inform the content that you create going forward, right? You see success and you chase it. Um, now, unfortunately, you know, nothing is forever. Um, the uh, Greek philosopher Heraclitus said that you can't step in the same river twice. 
And, uh, you know, advertising is like that, too. You're going to get it out there. You know, at best, it's going to succeed for a while, but things will change and eventually its time will come to an end. And you need to figure out what your next step is going to be and what your step is after that and after that. And that means looking at the analysis, looking at what worked and isolating the successful parts so that you can iterate on them and you can replicate that success going forward and maybe even improve upon it. You have to test, optimize, and scale everything that you do. And those are not just empty words. Those are core. They are foundation to our business. And running the same ad over and over again could actually have a negative effect. It can make your business, your growth feel stagnant. So talk about everyone who's talking about you, fortify trust, crucial, crucial task of building credibility, social proof, key partnerships, trustworthiness, testimonials. Here is why a retail investor this ad's made from a testimonial from a retail investor that the audience can then project themselves onto. I invested because of the groundbreaking technology and all its potential uses. It would be the most useful material on the planet to be potentially used for virtually anything. Quick blurb, created more investments. Whole lot more traffic, more investments, more capital, just by putting that in front of an image uh, pertaining to your business. Catalyst, meet the partnerships that help drive Catalyst. Wow, I trust them more just by looking at this. It's it's intriguing. I, I want to click in. I want to see what's going on there. And these can be created all day. You, you don't need the top graphic designer in the world creating something new for you. I mean, social media is built upon individual users. This is showing up in between their feed, their posts from their friends, their family, uh, maybe on Instagram, the people they want to be like, or people they met at a party five years ago that they kind of follow. Maybe they travel a lot and live vicariously through their their their, their stories. This is going to show up right there. It, it just needs to feel native, it needs to feel organic, it needs to feel like it's adding to the conversations. where those selfie videos come into play. But as this comes in, you want it to sell the click. You want it to get the audience over there Abby, what about these examples? What's going on on uh, on these creatives? Building trust can take the shape in many forms, right? Um, always want to be celebrating partnerships. Right? So Adam Beam and in Marset, you see a, a you know partner logo. Um, Let's see, what are we seeing here? Partnership. Bum, 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 bum. I'm always encouraging everyone to get reviews, whether it's an e-commerce uh, play or it's an investor acquisition campaign. Reviews are <laughs> invaluable. Uh, it's it's possibly one of the most important things that you can do to build trust because, you know, I, you know, you want to hear it from someone else. Is it worth it? Why should I do this? You know, oh, someone else has already done it before. It's it's probably okay. Oh, oh, these people are trusted by a well-known investor. Oh, well, that's a really good sign. These kinds of buy recommendations really, uh, they don't come necessarily without effort. Okay, think about that for a minute because founders often think I'm going to launch my campaign. Everybody's going to just, they're going to recognize that I have a brilliant solution to the, the problem. But without having other, other people talking about you, other building that social proof and, and um, making sure that your messages are being heard by the right people, it's going to fall flat. You really do have to, to put some effort into building trust and getting a good buy recommendation or review is is worth every effort that goes into getting that <laughs> do you have to put yourself out there you have to ask for reviews anyway webinars as a weaver uh i did touch on this a bit earlier um so absolutely critical in people invest in the founders i just hear it again and again we, we want to see the team behind uh behind the company um, it's a key thing that institutional investors look for. Um, and you, you really have to, as a CEO founder, need to be willing to put yourself out there, tell them why they should invest, give them the chance to ask their questions. 
Um, Jason, what would you add to this? Long form content. It adds more depth, have a lead investor, have a lead uh, partner, ha have any type of industry leader there, have them share with their audiences and then make the messaging tell the tale of this upcoming massive news break in the form of the webinar. What about generative AI? AI needs to be a lot of data fast. The data involved is compaction friendly. Compaction can be... These are all parts of slides of the presentation, the ad creative, the content leading up to it. You, know, you think a webinar is just the live webinar. It's a lead magnet. You're able to run ads to a webinar signup page. You're able to email everyone about what you're doing, about this upcoming presentation. You're able to have ads talking to it in the retargeting side. You can post on social portal update ev everywhere, amplify impact through knowledge sharing, give the knowledge that they fully need to understand the offering, have it feel like, have it be better than a sit down with you and what that would look like in person. And it gives you something to talk about. It's difficult to come up with 12 social posts a month or more. Uh, it's difficult to do that for six months, 72 campaigns. A lot of the, the top campaigns on Start Engine and Nick Capital, we fund our live for these long periods of time. Uh, so you, you really need to map it out in the strategy and then continue to bring in all of the, the cues, all of the signals out there to determine what to talk about next and keep it exciting. Uh, Mark, how do we create a sense of immediacy? Uh, we have eight minutes left in the webinar. We want to jam pack everything in here. How do we jam pack? how much time they have left into a post and what does that mean for messaging? Yeah, I mean, you know, FOMO, 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 right? Um, there is this extraordinary opportunity. You're seeing it now. Maybe you saw it before, maybe you didn't. You're seeing it now and this may be your last opportunity to get on board. And if you don't, Oh, you just, you just might regret it. You know, people, people fear more than they love in a lot of ways, um, psychologically. So it's like, they don't want that feeling of this was something that could have been great and I missed out. You know, I, I mean, I know so many people who had the opportunity to, to buy, like, for example, Bitcoin, you know, when it when it was first released, you know, they could have just gone right out there and gotten a hard disk full of it. Um, but they didn't. Um, and to this day, they talk about the things they could have, they would have, they should have done. Um, you know, we can talk about things like Google. You know, you read stories about the people who like painted the mural on Google's wall being paid in uh, in stock. And how that worked out for them. And they want, you know, people want to be that person. And the thing about, you know, crowdfunding is it gives you the opportunity to potentially see these things at the very beginning. But you don't want to miss that chance. And that's what this messaging is getting at. You know, what we're trying to say in each case, there, there's something special here. There's something extraordinary and uh, the door is closing, you know? I mean, do you want, you know, even, you know, for, for, for many of these investments, you know, it, it's it's just a nominal sum, sum of money, but the payoff can be, you know, potentially truly extraordinary. You know, both in money and in stories, you could tell, right? At parties, you'd be like, oh yeah, let me, let, me, let me tell you a little story about a company called Tesla that I heard about. You know, when it was just in its pre-production stage, I threw a couple bucks their way. Okay. You want to be make it so that it's you telling that story. You don't want to be the one listening to it. And exactly. that's the kind of feeling you're getting out there. And the audiences latch onto the headlines. We talked about the narrative. Uh, it doesn't have to be for everyone, just your targeted audience. Uh, I see so much poor creative out there. Uh, I take screenshots. I'm a highly targeted audience for these investor campaigns. And I get you know dozens, if not hundreds a month that I add to a photo album. 
<laughs> for the whole team to share. Happy to share it with you guys if you reach out too. But uh, avoid repetition, overuse phrases. It's going to show your brand logo at the top of a meta advertisement. If you put the logo in your image, if you then start your your text and your headline or newsfeed link description with your brand name, it's repetitive. If you're overusing phrases, you know, you want to pack a punch, highlight stats, numbers, as we talked about, create curiosity, as Mark's saying, get audience excited to learn more. You're creating the energy that they're going to land on your landing page with. This is where you prime them. It's also where sometimes ads feel like product ads and you get an audience there and now they're presented with an investment and they're not going to convert because they didn't know that's the room that they were walking into. You have to set the audience up for the actions you're going to take next with that language. What about the mobility, Abby? Well, we're coming up on the holiday season where we see people making more and more purchases off their mobile device. And I think this also translates to investments because we often target those same channels, right? Like uh, imagine you're scrolling through your Instagram feed or Facebook and, um, and you, it's this time of the year when you're starting to think about buying gifts. It's, it's like more in the mood for buying stuff. It's have, I don't know about you, but I have all these people I have to buy gifts for coming up. And so I just get into, I feel like I start buying more things anyway. So you really um, have to expect that people are going to be viewing your offering on their mobile device. People spend more and more time on their phones and it has to be compatible. It also has to work on a desktop, but a huge amount of this traffic is coming from people on their phones and you have to be ready for that. People will bounce if it takes too long to load a website. So that can be a place where people fall off. Um, and that's really disconcerting. It's not even about your message. It's just simply about the load speed. You have to test all these things as you're building out your customer journey or your marketing funnel. Um, and definitely yeah, test, test it and uh, test it on your device, on your mobile. I Most heard an even more mobile. shocking stat last week. We we're at, at Investment Week, and and I think it was it was one of the fintech portals that hosts a lot of the Reggae Plus. They said eighty percent of the purchases on their platform came through mobile, and we're talking minimums of like five thousand dollars and more in some cases. So, you know, you should expect people are coming to your offering on their on their phone. Mobile first, if they That's come from it. a desktop or laptop, great. But you want to make sure those legible font sizes are there. We see campaigns that have trouble with conversion rate because of the mobile uh, loading speed. Picture it coming from there and simplify with precision. Keep complexity at bay in messaging, deliver messages that are easily understood by a wide audience, craft content that directly addresses current situations and empathizes with stakeholder needs. Uh, we you know, really are running millions of ad impressions to audiences of that size to produce, you know, hundreds of thousands of clicks, tens of thousands of clicks, and a few thousand conversions, a few thousand investments. And if you look at it from that light, if you look at the messaging that you're pulling audiences in with, what you're going to retarget with them, what you're going to nurture them with until the point of investment, you're already ahead of most issuers out there. Uh, use numbers, use messaging uh, that talks about social proof, talks about momentum, traction, development, talk about these upcoming events. Your brand has to feel like the next big thing in your industry or an industry that's getting created from the ground up. And if the messaging does not accomplish that, you you will lose the attention or at, at you know, at least not get the investment from those audiences once they get there. Uh, we are open for questions at any point. Please feel free to reach out to us. I saw a question here and confirm, yes, this this is a full body suit. Um, also, yes, we uh, are happy to hop on a call anytime to, to talk about your specific campaign uh, and messaging around it. Mark, any final thoughts you want to leave listeners with? Sure. I mean, you know, the what I would say is as a heuristic just always step back ask you know from the perspective of someone who is not familiar with my industry what do i do thing one 
Thing two, why does it matter? Thing three, what kind of market does it serve? And thing four, why am I the best person to do it? I think if you've got those four as your foundation, they will take you far. So that's that's my little tip. And Abby, parting words as we wrap our Halloween webinar. I think the last slide we glanced through, but it is incredibly important. It's uh, simplicity is everything. Yeah, the the simpler the message, the faster you can get your point across to people, the better. Um, but if you don't do any marketing, they're not going to see your offering in the first place. So you do have to get the word out. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and it has to be strong enough for the audience, not, not only to resonate, but to repeat to those around them. Mm -hmm. Like you said, Abby, um, I buy off ads all the time, invest. I, I bought this off an ad. I, I'm a sucker for a good advertisement. Uh, that is what you need to be looking at. This is largely a marketing exercise. It is not the same as traditional fundraises, perhaps, but on a on a you know digital landscape and using scale. Uh, please reach out to us. We are an open book. We could have these slides sent to you, we can send you the video recording. Uh, like to share what we see working in the space and efforts to see a higher success rate industry-wide. Abby, Mark, thank you for your time joining today and getting this thought leadership out there. I want to thank all attendees as well. Please feel free to uh, reach out to Abby, Mark on LinkedIn, and we will see you next month. Take care.